So two hours ago, I did not know I was going to be standing right here. I landed, I came down the stairs, and Lori was sitting there waiting for me, and she was wearing a TEDx shirt. I said, oh, I love your shirt. I said, TEDx, I have never spoken at a TED event before. <laughs> she said, well, our speaker just canceled. Would you like to do it? Would you like to speak? My first reaction, honestly, was no. <laughs> and the reason why was I just came from San Francisco. I got up at 4 in the morning. Last night, I was speaking to the San Francisco 49er football team. That day, I spoke to the coaches. I was there all day talking with various coaches who wanted to talk to me about leadership and so forth. So the last thing I wanted to do was actually speak to more people. <laughs> but now, we're driving in the car, and I started to think about the people that were here. I said, how many people are going to be there? She said, 400. And then I started to think about my vision, my mission. And it has always been to inspire and empower as many people as possible one person at a time. And I just kept on getting this nudge that said, you know, if you don't do this, you are not living your vision. You are not living your mission. You have to do it. And so about two miles later, I said, okay, I'm doing it. Let's go. <laughs> and so here I am right now. And that mission and vision started many years ago when I was miserable and I was negative and I was actually fired from my dot-com job. It was during the dot-com crash, and our company was sinking faster than the Titanic. It was really bad. It was really bad. And my life was crumbling at the same time. My marriage, my home, and my wife said, where is that man that I married? Where is that guy who was positive? And I had lost that positivity. I had lost that vision for my life. And I remember in that moment saying, what am I born to do? Why am I here? And writing and speaking in that moment just came to me. I'll never forget it. It just came to me. What will I write and speak about? Well, I needed more positivity. And so I started to do all this research on positivity. And that ultimately led me to write a book called The Energy Bus. How many of you read The Energy Bus just to get an idea? Okay, more than two. That's awesome. <laughs> That's why I have to stay positive. Well, I wrote that book in about three and a half weeks of divine inspiration. I remember just walking and praying as I was contemplating my future, and next thing you know, that idea for that book just came to me. And so I went upstairs and I started to write it, and three and a half weeks later, I had it. It was then rejected by over 30 publishers. <laughs> and finally, John Wally and Sons agreed to take on the book. I was so excited. I was talking to a friend. I said, hey, what should I do? He said, pray. <laughs> so I prayed for, for it to be a bestseller. It came out. It was a bestseller in Korea. <laughs> I learned you have to be specific with your prayers. <laughs> it is this huge hit in Korea. I mean, I'm getting all these emails, all these calls from Korea saying, come to Korea. But not one bookstore in the United States would carry that book. I remember my publisher calling me the David Hasselhoff of Korea. <laughs> So I decided to go on a 28-city tour, paid for it by myself. My publisher wouldn't even pay for it. So I went from city to city sharing the message in the book. We had five people in one city. We had 10 people in another. We had 20 people in another. The most people we had were 100 people in Des Moines, Iowa. They thought Jeff Gordon was coming. <laughs> that's why they showed up. And that's not a joke, that's truth. I remember I got home, I was so exhausted, I was so tired, but I was living my vision, living my mission. That's what was driving me. And I just collapsed. And my wife was so supportive. You know you're with the right person when they give you strength. And she was giving me strength during that time. And after that moment, I could literally tell you all the amount of times that I met someone who met me on that tour and shared the book with a friend who worked for school. And I started to work with schools. And then another friend was a coach. And I started to work with sports teams. And then someone ran a business. And I started to work with businesses. One person after another. And now, 10 years later, here I am getting to speak to you <laughs> about my vision and mission.
the book was number two in the Wall Street Journal bestseller list this week, actually, 10 years later. Yeah. But I don't tell you that because I want you to be impressed with me. I tell you that because I want you to look inside yourself because I know that you have a vision. I know that you have a mission. I know that there is something that you are born to do. I know there is a difference you are here to make, and that's why I am here to talk to you. There's someone here that I was meant to talk to today. Out of all the things that would happen that would bring me here, I believe there's someone who is meant to hear this. And I think you're also meant to hear that it's not just about vision, but it's also about your belief and your optimism that must fuel your vision on this journey. Because we all have this vision of where we want to go, right? We all have this north star that guides us in the right direction. I call it your telescope. You have this telescope where you, where you see the future. But we must also pull out the microscope. And the microscope are those zoom focused actions we must take each day to realize the picture in the telescope. And that microscope is often a grind though. It's a lot of hard work. It's a lot of rejection, it's a lot of failure, it's a lot of obstacles, it's a lot of setbacks. I mean, I went from city to city on that tour, and I can't tell you how many other times since that I've gone to places that I wouldn't even bring my dog to in these hotels, but I've gone there to share a message. And so belief and optimism also fuels us. And people say, you know, life is like a marathon. Other people say it's like a sprint, right? No, I say it's like running through an airport trying to catch a flight. <laughs> my family and I, we were flying from Jacksonville, Florida, where we live, and we were going to Maine, first time ever going to Maine. We were connecting in the Philadelphia airport. We arrived an hour and a half late for our connecting flight. We landed in Terminal A, and we were leaving from Terminal F. I know in Philly you have to connect that C-16, which is really far from A, you get to C-16, you then have to take a bus shuttle, which then takes you to F. I look at the screen, we only have 10 minutes to make our connected flight. I'm thinking there's no way we're gonna make it, but we have to go for it. So I look at my wife and kids, and my children were eight and 10 at the time. I said, all right guys, let's start running. <laughs> and there we are now running through the airport. Have you noticed more people running through airports? I see it all the time. The next time you see someone run by you in an airport, I want to encourage you to do what I do. Cheer them on. <laughs> the other day in Atlanta airport, this woman was running by me and I said, go, 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 I believe in you. You could do it. <laughs> and she was struggling. I mean, she was having a hard time as I cheered her on. But as she ran by me, I mean, she gave me the thumbs up like this. <laughs> I don't always get that response. <laughs> I was in LaGuardia Airport once and this guy was running by me and I cheered him on and he gave me the finger. <laughs> it's all right, I turned a negative into a positive. I said, that's right, you're number one. <laughs> so that was us now. We're running through this airport and we're huffing and puffing and we're doing our best. And finally we get to C-16 and there are no bus shuttles there. I look at the watch, five minutes to make our connect and flight. There's a woman who's handling all the buses. I said, how long do the buses get here? She said, four minutes. So my children start crying. We're not gonna make it, we're not gonna make it. I turned to them, I said, guys, you have to stay positive. You have to believe we're gonna make it. I'm telling you, we're gonna make it. I turned to the woman, I said, we're gonna make it, right? She said, you ain't gonna make it. <laughs> So finally the bus arrives, we get on the bus, we get to Terminal F, it's the last gate. So now we are sprinting down Terminal F as fast as we can. I left my wife and kids in the dust. <laughs> I was getting on that plane with or without them. <laughs> but just as I arrived, guess what happened? It wasn't delayed, they slammed the door right in my face. I said, man, my wife and kids, they're on their way thinking that would help. He said, I'm sorry, sir, there's nothing I can do. I said, you don't understand, we have all these plans, all the other flights are booked, we'll have to stay overnight in the airport, it will ruin everything, we have to get on this plane. He said, I'm sorry, sir, the plane is pushing back, look. My wife and kids arrived in that moment. We walked to the big window. We see the small plane, it's pushing back, and we are just so dejected. But as we're watching this plane push back, we realize that we, we could see to the cockpit. And then we realize that we could see the pilots. We realized that they could see us, we make eye contact. So my wife and kids start jumping up and down, waving to the pilots. 
But a minute later, the door opens, a woman comes out, she says, it worked. <laughs> They're going to let you on the plane. We're so excited. We walk down the stairs on the tarmac. They stopped the plane. The passengers were not very positive. <laughs> we take off. We land. Another miracle occurred. Our luggage made it too. A true miracle that our luggage would make it like that. So we're driving the way in the rental car. I think, okay, this is a great teachable moment for my children. I said, so what would you learn from this experience? I think they're going to say, you know, Dad, I want to stay positive. I wanted to believe. My eight-year-old son said, you know, Dad, I want to just keep running. <laughs> and as he said it, though, I thought, you know, there's so much truth to that. You know, so much of our success in life is that we just keep running. We stay positive, and we never give up. One thing I just spoke to the Niners about was grit. Andrew Duckworth, the number one predictor and factor of success is grit, the ability to work hard, for a long period of time towards a goal, to persevere, to overcome, to keep moving forward in the face of adversity, failure, obstacles, and rejection. Grit drives us. Grit moves us forward. But then what drives grit? And it is that vision. It is that belief and that optimism, that staying positive on the journey of where we're going. And all the research shows and supports that. But I also believe that it is a love of what we are doing. Because if you don't love it, you will never be great at it. And so when you have this vision and you have this mission of where you're going, the love of what you're doing must be greater than the fear of failing. And if you love it, you won't fear it. And I have to tell you, in all the journeys that I was taking, all the road trips, everywhere I was going, and even coming here, yes, there was fear. But the love of being able to share this message is what drives you to overcome it. And so love casts out fear. Love is greater than fear. And love drives you to make a greater impact and a greater difference towards this vision that we have. And then I also believe it's purpose. It's having that, that purpose to do something greater. We don't get burned out because of what we do. We get burned out because we forget why we do it. There are going to be days we get up that we don't really feel very positive. There are going to be days that we sort of lose sight of our vision. And that is where we need to give us, we need a bigger purpose to give us something to be positive about. That purpose to, to fuel us and keep us fresh. My dad passed away a month ago. And when you see your dad pass away and go, and your mom died 10 years ago, it really makes you think about your life. It really makes you think about your purpose. And at the end of my life, I want to know that I took chances. I want to know that I said yes to things like this. That I would literally get off a plane and then an hour later would be here wearing a suit where I was wearing just t-shirt and a shorts earlier. <laughs> and, and I want to know that in the future that someone's going to see this. And they're going to meet my kids, who are now 18 and 16. And they're going to meet my kids one day, maybe long after, they're, um, long after I'm gone. And they're going to say, you know what? Your dad helped me live my purpose. Your, da your dad helped me find my vision and move towards it. And ultimately what we realize is that the vision that we have, the optimism we have, the, the purpose that we have ultimately is not just about us. It's about others. It's not just about being our best. It's about bringing out the best in others and then leaving a legacy along the way. What legacy will you leave and what will drive you to achieve it? Thank you so much.